So welcome everyone today to Psalms Through the Eyes of the Living Letters. Today, uh, we're actually in Psalm 119 again. I mean, we've been going through Psalm 119. For those of you that are just now joining us, uh, we've been through going through Psalm 19. <laughs> My tongue got tied there a little bit. We've been going through Psalm 119 for, for quite some time. Uh, part of that being because there are eight verses each of each one of the 22 Hebrew Living Letters. And so we've been going through each one individually over the, the past uh, several weeks, and we've still got several more to go as we continue on. Today, we're going to be d diving into that portion of Psalm 119, verses 113 through 120, that are speaking about the living letter Samech. Now, Samech is, to me, probably one of the most mysterious and the most mystical if you will, of, of all of the living letters. To me, it's, its core seems so ancient that, that, the, that the only thing that I think predates Samech is the, the Yod itself. And, and I, I, don't know, I don't know how to describe it because I just, I've, I've sensed for quite some time Samech being a very, very ancient and mystical letter. And matter of fact, I, I one of the one of the letters that that as I began to dig into, uh, that the Lord began to reveal some great and awesome things about. I just knew there was more. So Samech has been one of those ones that for me has been a pursuit because I, I want to discover more and more of the, the hidden attributes of Samech. And the great part about it is is that that today. I'm going to talk about one of those new revelations. It's even for me when and in looking into Samech because I never saw Samech in this way before, and so um, I'm really excited about this. So now, for those of you that are new, we were using the Tahalim. We're not using the King James version or anything like that. The Tahalim is a uh, is a Hebrew writing, and we use something called the Art Scroll series Schottenstein edition of the uh, Tahalim. And so basically, it's just the book of Psalms in a book by itself. And uh, this particular book has the Hebrew on top and the, the, the English directly below that. So you can learn to, to, to be able to, to connect the literal translation of the word to the word itself. And it's, it, to me, it's a, a tremendous tool for digging into this. But as Father began to, to, to mess with me about this, you guys know that, that when when I begin to dig into these scriptures, especially as I prepare for our classes like this. Lord usually pulls out one thing, one or two things out of that scripture, and then I'll spend some time talking about that. Today really doesn't seem to be any different than that, but it struck me with, with where it took me is where I'm going to go. So today I'm going to start by reading the uh, Tehillim first, and then we're going to come back and dig into dig into this. So in Psalm 119, verse 113, it says this, in the Tahalim, and this is the, the, trans, the literal translation from the Hebrew. Um, I hate the free thinkers, but I love your Torah. Now, that particular one right there is where I want to spend some time digging into uh, a little bit today. So we'll see where Father leads us through in all of this. I hate the free thinkers, but I love your Torah. You are my concealment and my shield. I put hope in your word. Depart from me, you evil do doers, and I will guard the commandments of my God. Support me according to your promise that I may live. Disgrace me not in my hope. Sustain me that I may be saved, and I will always be engrossed in your statutes. You trampled all who stray from your statutes. For their deceit is falsehood. Like dross, you purged all the wicked of the earth. Therefore, I have loved your testimonies. My flesh shuddered from dread of you, and I feared your judgments. Now, in the in the beginning of this, and, in, and as we read through this, it seems like a very harsh and, and very hard uh, statement that, that, that David is crying out in the midst of, of this. And... Uh, and there are some very strong words that go along with this. But as I began to dig into this, there was one thing that jumped out on me. And that this, this was that first verse in particular. I hate the free thinkers, but I love your Torah. Now, the one I'm reading out here, here 
just for those of you that are new and for those of you that are just now joining us, uh, there's an Art Scroll series. It's called Art Scroll Digital Library. You can find it on both uh, the App Store as well as the Google Play and so on that allows you to, to have a free to Halim electronically. And, uh, and this is what I'm reading out of here on the screen, what you guys are seeing right now. But you can also purchase a book from Amazon. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I've got the links at the bottom of the description in YouTube. And uh, uh, so for those of you that are come back and, and, and review this, uh, just check those and you'll see the link to where you can purchase this book if you, if you so choose. And I, and I like this because sometimes it, it says it a little bit differently in the written book as, as it does actually in the, uh, in the digital library. Because uh, in the in the Tehillim itself, it says the plotters of evil I hate, but your Torah I love. But what grabbed me about this was number one: the living letter Samech is a letter that speaks about the supernatural support of Yahweh. And what do I mean by that? There's a story that's a it's it's really a metaphoric story, but yet in the same breath. I believe that there is truth to this as well, but so don't don't think I'm just talking about it being metaphoric only, but uh, it, it has a very strong metaphoric aspect to it, and that is that that when when Yahweh wrote on the original tablets. Now, from a Hebrew perspective, it is said that when when uh, Moshe went up to Moshe is Moses, Moshe went up to the mountain. He, uh, the, the Lord wrote on tablets of stone, and that those stones were actually sapphire tablets. They were sapphire stones, and not the rock that came down later after after Moshe had to go up and and rewrite those ones because the sapphire stones were the ones that he broke as he came down and found the Israelites with uh, having built the golden calf, and. Uh, but the, it is said of those that sapphire cube that the, the, the letters that were written on the sapphire cube were written by the hand of God himself. So when he touched the sapphire cube and he began to write the letters, that the letters went not just didn't just etch the top of the surface, but went all the way through the cube. So in other words, whether you looked at the cube from the front or the back, it was still the same thing. You could still see the letters that were a part of that. And with the living letter Samek, Samek is, is the only letter of the 22 original Hebrew living letters that is completely enclosed. In other words, it's, it's like a circle. And so the idea was that, of course, that, that if it was a complete circle, then the center, by virtue of gravity, should have fallen out and, and broken on the ground. But it didn't. That it remained in place inside of the sapphire cube. And it was being supernaturally supported by the Father. So Samek begins to describe this place of, of how the Father has taken care of us, how he is, he has, so he is supernaturally supporting us beyond the ability of, of, of our ability to be able to complete on the earth. The Father has, has, uh, has really given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. But it means more than that, because you know, when you go to uh, Hosea, and, and you begin to learn about Gomer. Gomer was Hosea's wife who was a prostitute. And in Hosea, in Hosea 2, it speaks about the place where that he would woo her and bring her back to himself, and that he would put a hedge of thorns around her. You see, Samech, one of the other literal translations of Samech, is a thorn, and it speaks about that hedge of thorns. So it's a place of protection. That's why in the first, second verse here, it says, you are my concealment and my shield. I put hope in your word, because he's talking about that protective place of Samech. And I love that, because when, when Father first began to uh, reveal this to me, and as I was meditating on it, one of the things that kind of hit me was the fact that it was a dual protection. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, one of the perspectives that I seen at the time was that that anything trying to come in to get at me would have to be able to try to penetrate this hedge of thorns to be able to get to me. So in other words, it would be completely tore up by the time it tried to get to me in the center of this because 
father had become this hedge of thorns around me. But I also saw it from the inside as well, because I thought, well, you know, if, if I try to break free from this hedge of thorns saying, I want to do what I want to do just because I've made the choice to do it, then I'm going to get tore up trying to get outside of this hedge of protection. And it, it just, for me, that just, that really settled in my spirit because then I realized that, 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 that at times, especially then, because I was still learning, I was still learning about the peace of God. I was still learning about the goodness of God. And, you know, there were all these times where I would, I would make choices that didn't really hear the Lord say yes or no about. So I thought I'll just do them anyway. But as I began to move towards that, that, that perspective or move towards that, that thing, then I would begin to lose the peace. Or in other words, the thorns would start getting me. Now, I know you'd be like, well, that's, that's cool and all, but, and that's a cool way of looking at it, but where does that relate in scripture with what I just said? The truth be told, it came when I realized that there was this, there's actually twice in scripture, not just once, there's twice in scripture that it speaks about the hedge of thorns. Remember Paul on the road to Damascus. And when the voice of the Lord began to speak to Paul, one of the first things that the father said to Paul was this, Paul, Paul, why do you kick against the goads? And the Hebrew word for goad there is literally speaking about a thorn. And so he didn't directly say that Paul had a hedge of thorns wrapped around him, but he did. And I realized that, that that's true of each and every one of us. Father, you are my concealment. You are my shield. You are the one who protects me. What really began to, to mess with me had to do with this first sentence. I hate the free thinkers, but I love your Torah. So what does that mean? What does it mean by I hating the free thinkers? Why, does, why is David not liking the free thinkers? Well, it comes, it makes a little bit more sense when we look actually at the Hebrew. And the Hebrew word there is se'afim, se'afim, and it's a samic, ayin, pe, yod, and mem final. Now, I'm going to go through each one of those so that those of you that have, don't know the Hebrew living letters, I'll at least give you some, some snippets of, of what each one of those letters mean, and, and it will help to make an understanding of, as to, to the definition of all this. But first... If you go to the to the Strong's Concordance and you begin to dig into uh, this particular word, what you're going to discover is this is a uh, I believe it's H fifty five eighty eight. For those of you that like to study, if you want to get into the Strong's Concordance, H fifty five eighty eight, and it talks about being divided. Sephim talks about being divided in mind. It's kind of like a, a, a skeptic or a thought, and and so. Another way of putting this, rather than just the free thinkers or the evildoers, another very, very good uh, transliteration that could be used there is double-minded. And that began to mess with me a little bit because I began to think, you know, well, many times when we're double-minded, we don't always realize that we're being double-minded about something. We, we, we think that the way that we see these things are right. But yet, even our words, when we begin to speak them, will, will sometimes reveal two different aspects about the, the, the same thing. And so it reveals that double-mindedness inside of our hearts. But this, kind of, this, this one kind of messed with me a little bit more than just that. Because the, the H5588 and the, the Sa'afim, or the part where it talks about being uh, divided or yeah, divided in mind, is, is related to H5586, which means to disbranch or to lob off like the top of a tree, to remove the, 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 the branches, that sort of thing. So it's talking about, you know, when we, when we talk about a tree, we've got the trunk of the tree, but what really allows the tree to be able to live and to survive? It's the branches and the leaves that are on the, on the outside of those, of those branches. But not only that, where is the fruit produced? Many times, well, not, not many times, with trees, where is the fruit produced? But it's on the branches itself. And so, in essence, this 
double-mindedness and this place where the branches have been removed because of the double-mindedness disallows fruit to be born. Really messed with me a little bit because there's a sto- there's a story. There's a story in the Talmud, and for those of you that uh, that have a Talmud, you can dig into this. It's Ta'anit Five B, and and uh, the Talmud is is a, is another one of the Hebrew books, and it it has uh, not only the the Torah in it, but it also it has stories that that begin to explain different aspects about the the Torah itself or about the first five books of the of the Bible. And this is the story. It's called the tree. It's literally it's called the tree. And I want you to listen to this. A man was traveling through the desert, hungry, thirsty, and tired. And when he came upon a tree bearing luscious fruit and affording plenty of shade, underneath which ran a spring of water. He sat down and he ate of the fruit. He drank of the water and rested beneath the shade. When he was about to leave, he turned to the tree and said, tree, oh tree, what, with what should I bless you? You've blessed me. You know, this is my, this is my, I'm interjecting here. You've blessed me. Now I want to bless you. Should I bless you with your, your fruit to be sweet? Your fruit is already sweet. Should I bless that your shade be plentiful? Your shade, your shade is already plentiful. That a spring of water should run beneath you. A spring of water already runs beneath you. And he says this, there is one thing which I can bless you. May it be God's will that all the trees planted from your seeds should be like you. Let me repeat that one more time. There is one thing that I can bless you. May it be God's will that all the trees planted from your seeds should be like you. Began to mess with me because I begin to think about heritage. I begin to think about legacy. I began to think about my family, you know, and and this this began to 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 mess with me because I I know that there's there's one thing that the Lord has has told has has spoken to me about it, and I wished I'd have known this back when I was younger because it would have it would have helped in so many different ways, but. I was growing, I was maturing, and there was, you know, just like all of us, we we walk through these places, and sometimes we look back and think that we wish that we could have thing, done things differently. And, okay, that's that's fair enough, but part of it is, is maturity. Part of that is growth. Part of that is even learning on our aspect. But I can start right now and move forward from this place. I don't have to worry about what's in the past. I can begin from right now. The father began, so in this, in looking at this, I wanted to go back and look at the word se'afim. And as I began to look at it, we've got samik, ayin, pei, yadi, 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 <laughs> yod, and them, sofit. All right. Samik, ayin, pei, yod, and mem, sofit. Samik. I've already described to you pretty well in the place where it's it's talking about the supernatural support of of God. Ayin is a letter that speaks about what we see. Ayin literally in Hebrew means I. So it talks about what we see. Now, those of you that have been with with me for any length of time, hear me talk about two questions that have have changed my life forever. And, And there's probably not a class that I don't go through, that we don't go through, that I mention at le- this at least once. And those two questions are, what do you see and how do you see it? Those two questions have, have helped me in, in digging deeper and understanding more, because then I realized that, that, that there was uh, how I saw something was completely based on what it was that I chose that I saw, if that makes sense. In other words, sometimes sometimes we can't always go by face value of what we see. There's one thing that the Lord has taught me more than anything else, and that is the place of looking beyond what you see that's right in front of your face. Don't be limited 
by what's in front of your face. If you guys can go there with me, actually, that's probably one of the first places that we can see double-mindedness because there's always something more behind. There's always another perspective. There's always more to be seen. And Father wants us to not just look at face value, but to look beyond. So, Ayin, what we see in the revelation of that, pay. Pay is a living letter that speaks about what we speak. And I love the way that pay is actually shaped because it's actually made up of two other Hebrew living letters. The cough, which speaks about the palm of the hand. And I love that because when we talk about the palm of the hand, we're talking about what we're doing. But then there's a yod that's attached to the top part of the living letter cough, and it forms the living letter pay doing so. And in the picture that I see when I see that, just, just in, in its most simplest terms, is a hand that has seeds on the inside of the hand. And it's the scattering of the seeds. Y'all remember the parable of the sower and how the sower, when he sowed the, the, the seed, some fell on the, on the walkway or the, the path, some fell in, in the rocks, some was mixed with uh, thorns and thistles, and then some fell on good ground. So it's the picture of that. But when we look at pay, pay literally represents the mouth. Specifically, now, not only, don't please don't, don't, don't just don't say that pay only means the words that we speak. Pay means so much more than that. However, one of the key uh, transliterations of pay has to do with what we speak. So let's take that metaphor of the hand and the, the seeds inside of the hand and scattering them and now change it to the mouth. Every word that we speak becomes like a seed. And as we speak, we, we scatter seed in that place. And those seeds that we speak are the ones that can then either land on the, on the walkway, land on the thorns and thistles, land in the rocks, or land in good ground. So once again, it begins to uh, open up some under, understanding. Now, the Yod Mem at the end of the Hebrew word Se'afim uh, actually is, is two letters that represent the multiplicity of something. So whenever you see a Yod Mem or an Im sound at the end of a Hebrew word, it's talking about the multiplicity of things. Uh, so uh, like... Uh, what's, what's a good word? Uh, Zedekim. Zedekim is the, is the Hebrew word for the righteous ones. Uh, so a Zedek or would be a righteous person. But we together are the Zedekim because there's a multiplicity of us. And that's exactly what this means. So think about what this is saying in the most literal sense when we talk about this Se'efim and the place of being double-minded that when we speak, that we are taking and scattering seeds, and these are the multiplicity of seeds of the things that we speak overall. Why do you think those two questions are so important? What do you see and how do you see it? Because they, they begin to allow us the opportunity to place intent behind what it is that we're speaking. You see, part of the reason why I brought this up had to do with the place of trees. You know, and as, as I was digging into this, one thing that came out of this, especially when we were looking about how the second part of that set of theme means to disbranch. It means to, uh, to remove the branches or to disallow it to bear fruit. There's actually another story that I want to talk about and bring out some other aspects of this. Father, I thank you. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're bringing about an understanding to each one of us today because I know that, that there's, there's such a, a beautiful aspect of, of looking of where we are right now and where we're going to allow us that place of, of allowing you, Holy Spirit, to then 
bring us to an understanding where there's a fear of the Lord, not a fear of, of, of being afraid, but yet in the same breath, it is that because I realize how powerful my words are, how powerful the seeds that you have given us, because your word even says, my word goes forth into all the earth and it will not return back void. The father has given us seeds for us to be able to scatter in the earth. And that's why it won't return back to him void. It will accomplish all that it was set out to accomplish. Matter of fact, that scripture goes on to say, just as the rains come down from heaven and waters the earth and the snows from the mountains, that it provides that, that not only does it, uh, does it allow us to, to allow his word to come back to him, but it provides seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And so this is the other story I wanted to go talk about. And this is actually in Ta'anit 23a. And it speaks a little bit more about that, that, that generational thing that I mentioned earlier. One day, Honey, we're just going to call him Honey right now for uh, just, just to keep it short, was walking along the road when he saw an old man planting a carob tree. Honey said to him, this tree, after how many years will it bear fruit? In other words, how long before this tree will be able to bear fruit? The man said to him, it will not produce fruit until 70 years have passed. Well, Honey said to him, isn't it obvious that you, is it obvious that you will live 70 years? This was already an old man. And uh, so how do you expect to benefit from this tree? Honey said to him, I found a fruitful world because others had planted it, just as my ancestors planted for me. I, too, am planting for my descendants, for those that are coming after me. Honey's perspective was not about the gratification of right here and right now. It was thinking ahead to the generations that were coming in after now, I don't want to get into eschatology, but I, I hear the, the, whole, the Lord begin to speak into me about this right now, especially as we're looking at this, because, you know, for many years, I've, I used to believe that, that we were the last generation. Who says that we're not? I don't know that whether we are. Matter of fact, the scripture even says no man knows the hour or the day. Not even the son knows the hour. Only the father knows the hour and the day. But I don't, I don't want to get, but I remember years and years and years, of course, especially as, as a young child, hearing this constantly, I lived in this place of constant fear of thinking, well, God, am I ever going to get a chance to drive? Am I ever going to have a girlfriend? Am I ever going to get a chance to be married and have kids? And, uh, you know, I, I was afraid Jesus was coming back right then and there. And then, boom, it was it was all over with. And, and I wasn't going to get a chance to be able to enjoy life or anything else. And, and of course, with all the things that are going on in the world right now, we've got a very similar atmosphere and kids are wondering, well, how is, you know, what, what's going on? Is this, anyway, you get the point of what I'm trying, I'm trying to make. The father's been messing with me in the sense where my life has been mainly wrapped up in that and that, that I have become double-minded in the aspect of seeing just that. Okay, I think that's, that's good enough for right there. I don't really want to get into the eschatological aspect of this right now. It's just, I want us to think, I hear Holy Spirit saying, let us think about those things that are yet still ahead. And preparing not only in the words that we speak, but also for the future generations. It's funny because when I was meditating on this the other day, I was, I was sitting out on my front porch and uh, I've got a magnolia tree up over on the left-hand side of my, of my yard, right in the front of the yard. And uh, of course, we live on a street that does have uh, power poles and, and has lines that that run above. They're not they're not they're not uh, in the ground. We live a little bit out in the country, and so um, they, we still have the power poles that run there. And 
uh, probably about a month or so ago, uh, we had the uh, the electric company come through and, and in preparation for the hurricanes because we live in a, in a hurricane prone area. Uh, they came through and chopped down all of the branches on one side of that magnolia tree. So when you pull into my front yard, you know, the, the, the power poles, which are right at the, the front part as well, just a little bit ahead of where the magnolia tree is, uh, uh, have all been lopped off on that one side so that none of the branches would fall. And of course, then drop the electricity for the people in our area. And we live kind of at the end of the road. So it would be a very, uh, uh, we're in a kind of a, a vulnerable spot and, a, and an important spot because the rest of the road is, is fed from, from where we are. And I was sitting out there thinking about this. And so one of the things that began to mess with me, began to mess with me about that magnolia tree and where it was planted, where it was, sit, where it was sitting at. Because of some other things that were there, I looked at this tree and I realized on the left or the back side, the back part to where my house was, it was beautiful and it was able to give shade because magnolia leaves, if you've ever seen a, a magnolia tree, are, are fairly large. They're bigger than most of, of the, the, the leaves that are on trees and they're very, very thick. So they're very opaque and it, it provides a beautiful sense of shade on one side. But on the front side where the, the power poles run, there's absolutely nothing. That shade was meant to be able to be for both sides. And to, be, to, to, to express the full glory of the tree, it was meant to be so that it was completely encircled, kind of like Semek. It was completely wrapped around that tree, but it's not. It's been lopped off on one side. So one side, you're, you're in the elements. You're, there's no protection from the leaves. There's no protection from the sun or anything like that. And it began to mess with me a little bit. Because in scripture, trees are a metaphor of us. They talk about who we are. Remember that the scripture says that we are trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. And so some of the things that we, we need to look at is sometimes where we're planted. And, and is, you know, our, is the glory of the tree able to, to express the full glory of the tree, sometimes depending upon where it's planted, there may have to be some things that are lobbed off, if you will, that actually doesn't allow the true glory of the tree to, to show itself. So I know I'm speaking very, very met met metaphorically, but when we stop to think about this, we see another aspect of that double-mindedness. And to me, that was the part that really messed with me the most about double-mindedness was that I began to realize some of you have have been hearing me talk over the last little bit. And uh, those of you that have been part of the Psalms class for a while, uh, I've been very open with, with things. And yeah, we all deal with things. And, and I love the fact that, that Father allows us to have a place where there's, there's, there's freedom uh, to be able to speak. And, and of course, in our, in our engagement time, I'm even more free to speak uh, because it's a time where it's just us. But um, with this being recorded, there's a, there's another aspect of this though that I, I I want to share because of what what I've shared before, and I told you guys over the last several months that that the Lord has taken me into a place where um, I'm hearing Him. Don't get me wrong, I hear Him every day, I see Him every day, and and we we talk every single day. But there's there seem to be some things that uh, there was there I knew there was more. And I was searching for that more, and I couldn't find it. And remember last, a couple of weeks ago, we, we talked about that place in Song of Solomon where the bride got up and she, she, she began to look for her, uh, for her lover, 
and she couldn't find him. So she went out to the streets and she couldn't find him. She went to the watchman. And then just a little bit past the watchman, the scripture says there in Song of Solomon that she was that she found that the, the one who she loved and she grabbed a hold of him and would not let go. And and that helped to begin, even in me, it began to help look at this from a, an, another perspective. But an answer to my prayer really came as Father began to mess with me about this right here. Because I really began to, to see this place of a, of a double-mindedness in myself that I didn't, I didn't really realize was there. Sometimes when you have two positive things, you have two good things, and, and both are right, both, both are godly, both are there, there. We're not talking about anything that's that's sinful or anything like that. I'm just talking about two godly things that are side by side with one another. And the question is, well, then what is it that you're looking at? What is it that you're expecting? What is it that you are, what do you see and how do you see it? You know, even the words, the very, the very questions that I ask, yeah, sometimes I struggle with, with those as well. Uh, Partly because sometimes I don't always know until the Lord reveals it to me. And in this case, that's exactly what happened. I know I'm speaking in generalities here, but I hope your your Holy Spirit, thank you for, for filling in the details with regards to this. But what I began to realize was that there were some things that I desired, some godly things that I desired on this one hand that were right. They were righteous. They were good. And then there was the word of the Lord to me, on the other hand. And I was thinking that both were true. But the Father began to mess with me, and I began to realize there began to be this place of, re of the realization that the Father said, what was my word to you? Yes, these are godly things to desire. There's nothing wrong with this. But what is my word to you? What is your focus in the midst of all of this? And it hit me. I realized that I had been being double-minded about these things. And in allowing this double-mindedness, inadvertently, I had, I, had almost, I had really placed a veil between myself and the Lord, thinking that, well, both of these things are godly. But the moment that the Lord showed me that veil and gave me the opportunity to rip that veil down, it was just like the scripture that we talked about in Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, where just past the watchman, she found the one whom she loved, and she grabbed a hold and would not let go. And there's, it's, there's stir, there began a stirring inside of me of a focus like I've never had before. So, Father, I want to thank you that you guys have actually watched even me walk through this place where I've told you over these last few weeks and then come to the place that right here in the middle of the scriptures that we've been talking about this whole time and, and walking through all these different aspects, the Lord is walking me through this, this place. And I would venture to say that, that this is speaking to a lot of you today, not only here in the class, but also on YouTube. You're speaking, it's speaking to you in that place of saying, you know, I know there are two things and they're, they're both two right things, but am I being double-minded even when there are two righteous things that I may be looking at? Father, I need your focus. Father, I thank you for your focus. I thank you for the place that you have given me the opportunity to step inside of you and to see through your eyes. And in the place where I see through your eyes, I can see from your perspective. And in doing so, Father, that I can be just like Yeshua in that I only do what I see my Father do because I have chosen to look through your eyes. Help me, Lord, with the double-mindedness, even in the righteous place where, where it's too good and godly things that could be going on. But, Father, you had spoken one particular word to us, and, and we, 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 tried to, we tried to, you know, really juggle the fence in the midst of this, Father, allow us to, to see the truth of what that word is to us. And it did. It began a process in me where the, 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 there's, there's a, new, a, a newfound focus that I didn't have from before. 
And I'm walking out of that place of where now I'm seeing the, the, the Lord, there's, there's, there's an opening, there's a new revelation, there is a new focus. Now you see where in, in looking at this, so let's, let's kind of, let's kind of, we can do this, there's nothing wrong with this. Let's kind of use the rest of this psalm, this psalm that I just uh, was speaking about, and instead of using the word evildoers or, 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 or if you will, the uh, free thinkers, let's use the word, uh, let's use the word double-minded. Let's use the word double-minded. I hate the double-minded thinkers, but your Torah I love. Because why? You are my concealment and I'm and my shield, and I put hope in your word. Depart from me, double-mindedness, and I will guard the commandments of my God. I will guard your word in my life. Support me according to your promise that I may live. Disgrace me not in my hope. Now, now there's this place where there's the, a newfound strength as as, as we move forward from the place of realizing there is a place of double-mindedness. Sustain me that I may be saved and I will always be engrossed in your statutes. You trampled all who stray from your, stra- your, from your statutes for their deceit is falsehood. If you will, let me look at that for just a second. You, stra- you trampled all who strayed from your statutes, for their deceit is falsehood. Like dross, you purged all of the double-minded from the earth. Therefore, I have loved your testimonies. My flesh shuddered from, from dread of you, and I feared your judgments. Mishpat. You see, the last part there. I know, I know one thing that, uh, that, that for me, that I had a difficulty in really fully understanding had to do with the fear of God, um, because I knew that, that, that fear in the sense of the way that I had always known fear, that's being so totally afraid of something, would then keep me from being able to do what I was meant to do. But when it when we speak about the fear of the Lord, that's not the kind of fear that I think about. You know, I just I know there's a difference between the fear of of wrong or the fear of 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 an evildoer doing something to me or that sort of thing, and then there's the fear of God, and there's and it the fear of God to me has a has an air of respect or an honor to it, and that's exactly to me exactly what that that says. But the Lord took me into a deeper aspect of the understanding of the fear of the Lord. And that was in the place when I realized the, the heart of what the father was telling me about me. He said, Daniel, do you realize the power that you and everyone else in the entire world, do you realize the power that you have when you speak? Do you realize the authority that you have when you speak. When you speak, you create. And so in that place, there's a, there's a fear of or respect or then honor of the place of father. The, the seed that I have, the seed that I have was received from you. There was nothing in me before you gave me the seed. My word goes forth into all the earth. You gave me that seed and then gave me an opportunity to sow that seed. So, Father, may be the seed that I sow be just like the blessing that was spoken in that first story. There's one thing which I can bless you. May it be God's will that all the trees planted from your seed should be like you. Now, that, that can actually have two sides to it, right? In the case of the story, it was speaking of a tree that had plenty of water, plenty of shade, and plenty of fruit. But what if the tree isn't? What if the tree's been lobbed off? What if the tree has, has been double-minded? Then the seeds that come from that tree 
will be just like that tree. So a, there's, a, there's a place of fear and honor in looking at that. So may my flesh shuddered from the dread of you, and I feared your judgments. Why? Because I have a part to play in that. You gave me your seed. And Father, I want the seed that I sow be the seed that you planted inside of me that has grown good ground, that has, brought, that has, that has produced fruit. I know today seems a, a bit heavy, uh, and and I and I and I, I don't really apologize for that. It's this is this has been a shaking for me as well as I began to realize the place of double mindedness in myself, and 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 even though it was a godly or I thought was a godly double mindedness, I had to shake myself from it to to realize. Now wait a minute, I've I've not done the thing that I should have done because I was thinking that the other thing was something that was righteous and good and something that needed to be focused on as well. And the Lord said, no, no, I've got your word that I've spoken to you. This is the place that I want you to focus. This is the heart of where I want you to go. So Father, thank you for, for, for maturing us and, and maturing me in this place of, of the understanding and, and then bringing about a place of double-mindedness that I didn't realize that I had. And so, Father, I, I thank you that the, the, the trees that are planted from my seed, Father, would be the expression of, of exactly what I am right now in that place of my heart turned to completely towards you, that, that it's your word that I want to do. It is, it's, the, it's, it's your seed that is growing in, in, in my tree, and that people, when they, when they are able to, to eat that fruit, that, that seed would be planted in them. I remember years ago, y'all, uh, I remember many years ago, and this has been, I'm talking about 20, 30 years ago, back when I was younger, one of the ways that I would describe the, the place of the propagation and the, and, the, and the way that the kingdom would grow had to do with just that. If I'm a tree planted by the rivers of living water that springs forth fruit 12 months out of the year, then there would be some that would come along and they would see the fruit hanging from my tree and they grab a hold of that fruit and begin to eat of it. And of course, the seed is contained within the fruit itself and it plants the tree inside of them. Now, it's not the tree of Daniel, Jedediah, Cook. No, it's the tree of the Lord. It's the, it's the fruit of the Lord. It's the expression of the, the seed that came from the Father himself that's being planted in others and allowed to grow from that place. So I'm not talking about propagating my own ideas. No, I'm talking about prop, the propagation of the Father and his word in each one of every, every one of us. And that grew the kingdom because it allowed the seeds to multiply themselves again and again and again. If one tree can birth three trees, then three trees can birth six trees or 600 trees. And then, you know, you get the point. Then there's the, the place where, where each one of us have a part to play in sharing with one another. You guys have heard me say, and I'm going to wrap up with this. You guys have heard me talk about the place of, of the treasure and the treasury rooms of heaven. Inside of the treasury rooms of heaven, there's not just finances. It's seed. It's, it's, it's situations. It's people. It's things that we don't even have any idea that we know about. And Father has already placed those inside of us. As we come together and as we begin to share with one another, what we're doing is sharing of that seed. So the treasure that's been planted in you, now I get to share in that treasure. The treasure that's been planted in me, you guys get to share of that treasure. And, and to me, that started to make sense when, when I remembered the scripture that said that. Uh, uh, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And I was, I was like, now, wait a minute. That's, that's a completely different spin on the way that I'd always, I'd always seen that scripture. Yes, Father, you are exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think. And I know you can give me a far above all that I could ask or think. But I never imagined to look to each and every one of us as being a part of that connection. But it is. Each and every one of us are a part of the treasuries that the Father has given us. And as we share that treasure, that we can see that, that he is exceedingly abundantly, and he can give us exceedingly abundantly. 
above all that we can ask or think. Father, we bless you. We thank you. Thank you for this place in Semek where you've began to teach us not only that place about your protection, not only that place about your supernatural support, but Father, you've you've begun to show us that that other side of Semek, in that it in then in that it speaks about the place of seed and the growth of seed. And that Father, that that there are times that we may plant things that we may never reap from directly, but our descendants will, our children will, our children's children will reap from those things that we planted. So, Father, I thank you that that we see in this place the growth of your kingdom. We see the place where each one of us have a part to play, and each one of us is necessary in this, this, this fullness of your kingdom and the expression of your kingdom. Father, if, you can go, if, if we can go there, who we are as the new Jerusalem, each joint supplying, each brick being fitted and joined together in such a way that each supplies all that's needed, Father, through you. Father, we recognize that all of this comes through you. And we thank you for that. Now, love you guys. And, and I'm so thankful for those of you that have been joining us here. This, this class is beginning to grow. And I'm so thankful that Father has, has, uh, has been bringing more and more folks into the live class. Those of you that are watching on YouTube, we would love for you to join us here uh, because we're about ready to go into what we call the engagement session or the engagement time where we get a chance to, to be able to share with one another. And we would love for you guys to be a part of this. Um, the, the links are in the bottom of the description there in YouTube. And if you would like to trade into our ministry, if you've been blessed by what we've talked about today, please feel free to trade into our ministry as well. Um, we, we, the, the Father has, thankfully, the Father has put me in a place where, where I, can, I can focus on just ministry. So your, your ministry supports our ability to be able to, to continue the things that we're doing. So blessings and shalom to all of you, and uh, we will see you next time.